Kindred, happy Sunday. Let us pray. Jealous God, fierce and faithful, may the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts and minds be pleasing and acceptable unto Thee, our guide and our destination. Amen. God is clearly doing something new today in this Sunday of Lent. God is cleaning house, so to speak. Today's story, I always imagine the cleansing of the temple in the context of spring cleaning. It's like God's house needs a little bit of cleaning too sometimes. And it's interesting the way that it's framed in John. Quote, since it was almost Passover, Jesus went to Jerusalem. It's important for us to know, John says, that it's almost Passover. This year, Passover is approaching us. So it's going to be those last days in March, and we'll together celebrate Easter, which coincides always with that season of life in the Jewish calendar. And Jesus, in preparation for Passover, commits the unpardonable offense for which he's ultimately crucified. He cleanses the temple, making a whip out of cords. It says, Jesus drove them all out of the temple, even the cattle and the sheep, and overturned the tables of the money changers, scattering their coins, and then he faced the pigeon sellers. Take all of this out of here and stop turning God's house into a market. He makes a whip. Out of cords, he braids it. The, the word is uh, fregelion, fregelion, sometimes translated as scourge. Uh, it's an instrument, a Roman instrument, of specifically public punishment. I imagine him sitting there on the temple steps, just slowly braiding together the bands of leather, fuming at what has become of his father's house. When he's finished, he makes it clear that the temple, the new temple, will be his body. Do the the money uh, lenders and the capitalists and the sellers of wares still make the the temple of God a marketplace? I I think Jesus is still a pretty hot commodity. Uh, You have made of my house, my body, a marketplace. It's also interesting to me, um, the line, it says, Jesus drove them out of the temple. Drove them out of the temple. The verb, drove, drove out. This is the, the Greek, uh, ekbalo, to drive out, to banish. It's the exact same verb that is used during the process of an exorcism. When demons are driven out of a human body. He's preparing his father's home and his body for the Passover and for the passion that is about to come. I have uh, some personal experience in driving things out of places. I lived in a a teeny, tiny, leaky studio apartment in one of the worst neighborhoods in Memphis, Tennessee. I had these huge palmetto bugs about the size of a fat mouse. These big, noisy cockroaches. You'd have to hit him with a shoe just to get him to look at you, pay attention. Imagine Jesus driving these things out of his home with a braided whip. Get out, he says, out. And I complain the little ladies at the church there in Memphis and say, oh, that's not, those aren't like the bad cockroaches. That's just a garden bug, sweetheart. Well, so it belongs to the garden, I'd say. Well, This is important to understand. Is Jesus against people buying and selling things? Is he against conducting trade or doing business? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think Jesus is making some kind of blanket indictment of the free markets here. He's just saying, you don't do that sort of thing in my house. It's important, this reading. And it's also important because it does bring home the fact that Jesus wasn't a pacifist. He didn't simply endure, but was rather, at times, filled with passions for changing the way that the world operated. 
He clearly wasn't interested in everyone just getting along with everyone else. We've very much done away with that Jesus, I think, in favor of the infant child, meek and mild. A commodified Jesus that is perhaps more palatable to a broader audience. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, nobody likes angry Jesus these days. Uh, he's he's kind of on the outs. Uh, we're conflict averse these days. Jesus is bad for business to go shouting at people and you know knocking over their tables. Uh, I am personally particularly grateful for the last line in the story we just heard from today uh, that Jesus answers them. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. They, re- they retorted, it has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it up in three days? The temple he was speaking of was his body. And it was only after Jesus had been raised from the dead that the disciples remembered this statement and believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. Listen, this is important. It was only after Jesus had been raised from the dead that the disciples remembered and believed the words that Jesus has spoken. There's a lot of grace in that for you and for me. A a great deal, I think, because, you see, it makes it clear, again, that the disciples do not simply believe. They don't simply have faith. There's nothing simple about it. They're terrified and confused and they doubt. And they believe after the fact. They're all of them. A lot of doubting Thomases from time to time. But only one of them gets in trouble for that. Wow. But they remember. They remember the words that Jesus had spoken. There's this beautiful Jewish, uh, it's a Passover song. I used to sing it with my nieces when we would go to uh, Tat Shabbat uh, out together in Boston. And you, many of you probably have heard this song. It's Dayenu. Dai, Dayenu, Dai, Dayenu, Dai, Dayenu, Dayenu, Dayenu. Ilu hotsi, hotsianu, hotsianu, mimitriim. Dayenu. Dainu just means simply, it would have been enough, or it would have sufficed. The song is clever because it teaches the little children all the things that Hashem has done for them. And the chorus is always, it would have been enough. There are 15 stanzas, each of them explaining one of the 15 gifts given by Hashem during the Passover. And each ends with, it would have been enough. If he had brought us out of Egypt, it would have been enough. If he had executed justice, it would have been enough. If he had split the sea, it would have been enough. If he'd fed us manna, if he'd given us a a Sabbath, if he'd built the temple for us, it would have been enough. And I think about this song a lot during the season of Lent season of reflection on the ministry of Jesus Christ. And I'm loath to appropriate this song to Christianity because we've already, I think, appropriated more than our fair share from our Jewish siblings. But I can't help but think over and over again that what Jesus has done for me is so much more than sufficient. So far over and above what might Make me desire to worship him and dedicate my life to him and his kingdom. That I think of his lowly birth. That to enter the world in the form of an infant and so then to celebrate the holiness and personhood of babies and children, that would be enough. To choose then the poor of of the world, the poor people as his people, and to choose from among the poor and the lowly his saints and his disciples, this would have been enough to deign to receive from his cousin John the same baptism that I received. This is more than enough. And yes, to enter into death, 
and to defeat it ultimately and forever. This would be more than enough. And indeed, oftentimes this is the only thing uh, that he's celebrated for, uh, especially among some of our more uh, uh, evangelical peers. But he also went far beyond this, and he gave the world, and in so doing gave to me personally, a body of literature for how to organize my life. A way of understanding and being in the world that can only be described as, 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 as shalom, as peace, as a truce with reality, whatever you want to call it, even though it requires me to make sacrifices and do hard things and dare impossible things. He didn't need to give me his teachings. He could have simply defeated death and said, now you don't have anything to worry about. Eat, drink, be merry. The world is your oyster, which you with sword shall open. No, he deigned to give me his way of life, his teaching. They order and organize my life and my relationships. Sometimes it's simpler things. It's things like no one who does not receive the kingdom like a little child can enter into it. Love God with all you have and your neighbor as yourself. Right? Behold, the lilies and the ravens. Don't worry. Don't let your heart be troubled. And yet, even the hard stuff, even the hard stuff about camels and the eye of a needle or about the beam in my own eye, and the story of Lazarus and the rich man or the rich young ruler, all of these teachings he deigned to give to us. And I remember the words that were spoken by Jesus. I remember the words that were spoken by Jesus. He taught me not to make his body a place of commerce. He taught me that wherever two or more are gathered, he's there. He taught me about the communion. He taught me to question human authorities and how to do so with grace. And this, all this besides ransoming me from the power and authority of death. All this. And I remember the words that were spoken by Jesus. Each of us will face a day of reckoning where the ledger of our lives will be balanced against the ledger of the world. All that we are and have become will return to God. Every single one of us. In fact, that's one of the very few things that we all have in common. That, I think, and that we are all image bearers of the divine. And Jesus could have simply said, believe on me and be saved, and by that meant nothing more than believe that I've conquered death, confess, and be on your merry way. And that would have sufficed, I think. But he did so much more than that. He taught. He taught such beautiful things about reality and the world that lingers just beneath the surface of the world. When he taught in a way that when I allow myself to surrender to his teachings and his way of life, my own life is imbued with power and color and such richness and value and meaning that is completely detached from the values and meanings of the world, such that if someone, if someone said, let's go and make money with this, let's turn this into commerce, into capital, let's change uh, by the means of our ingenuity, this holy grace into commodity. I would, like him, make a lash out of braided cords and drive them out of the body of Christ in the holy temple. Mammon, money, how can I compare the priceless things given to me by Jesus Christ to something as base as lucre? Something that is so profane that we, all of us in the English-speaking world, dismiss it all the time, out of hand, when we say, well, you can't take it with you, right? Oh, no. It would have been enough for him to ransom me from death. He deigned, though, to give me, and all who desire it, a life for the ages, a life that no amount of money 
No amount of money. Not all the money of all the kings and empires of the world could ever purchase. And a life that's not for sale at any cost. He deigned to do that as well. And will it suffice? Oh, yes. Yes, very much. A peace that surpasses understanding. I believe that will be sufficient for me the rest of my life. If I remember the words that were spoken by Jesus. If I remember. Remember, saints. Remember. And give thanks. Amen.